Meanwhile, the novelist Lisa Opinionazzi continues her investigation into the case of Sigmund Freud, with wars that have raged over the claims that Freud gave birth to a new science, a science on trial. I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious in psychic life the role of instinctual urges, and so on. Out of these findings grew a new science. One has to remember that in the 1890s, when Freud develops psychoanalysis out of his training as a neurologist, he is on the cutting edge of brain science. Uh, it's real, serious, major science. Historian Sandra Gilman. It's just as important in terms of understanding psychoanalysis as uh, our understanding, for example, of the anxiety about uh, contagious disease in the 19th and 20th century is in terms of the discoveries of people like Koch and Pasteur. I call him a pseudoscientist because he made claims for which he had no adequate evidence. And there are reasons for suspecting that, that he himself knew this. Philosopher Frank Choffey. Suppose we take the very last book that he wrote, uh, The Outline of Psychoanalysis. He tells you things like the most profound trauma in the life of every uh, male human being is his very early discovery, age about three or four, that, that castration was a possibility. If we ask what grounds uh, Freud could have for believing this, we find them so radically uh, inadequate that we can't say that it's just a mistake. We're tempted to use words like the greatest intellectual confidence trick of the 20th century. Such radically opposed estimates of the work of Sigmund Freud are hardly unusual. Indeed, they're as old as Freud's invention of psychoanalysis itself, which developed and took on shape amidst fierce internecine feuds. A century later, battles still rage, though the terrain has shifted somewhat. It may now be granted that Freud, like a great artist, had some insight and understanding, that he offered us a vision of the place of sexuality in human life, the force, too, of unconscious fears and desires. It may even be agreed that, like some talented high priest, or despised Svengali, Freud founded a beneficial therapy, or a cult. But the very thing Freud most insisted on that he was a scientist engaged in researching the workings of the human mind in the laboratory of a consulting room, brings on a hail of bullets. The house of psychoanalysis, it is argued, has no empirical foundations, and its architect not a shred of scientific probity. Who are we to believe? And that question brings a second, perhaps larger one with it. Whose ideas of what science is should we take on board? If we're going to discuss Freud seriously, we have to look at the case histories. Now, I have, and I, I'm not satisfied with them. I, uh, sometimes I want to be provocative. I say something like this. The most radical anti-Freudian thesis you could put is that there are no Freudian phenomena. Not that he overgeneralized, that there's no evidence that anyone has ever come to grief because, as an infant, he uh, lost it after his mother and was afraid his father would castrate him. There's no evidence that any neurotic symptom is the uh, repressed manifestation of, of, of sexual uh, ideation. The answer from the psychoanalytic camp is a simple one. The only people I know who have made this claim are people who don't have the clinical experience. But I don't think it will ever be a hard science, as Freud wanted it to be. It will not be like physics ever. But if by science you mean, is there empirical cooperation for many of its hypotheses? Absolutely. Philosopher of mind, Marsha Cavell, who's now a trainee analyst. The kinds of things that Freud saw that he was talking about are still the kinds of things that psychoanalysts see, the phobias, hysterical symptoms, and so on. But evidence from the subjective inside of the consulting room rather than the objective outside is precisely what Freud's critics find suspect. And the case in Freud's defense is made more difficult by the vast and changing nature of Freud's work. Freud scholar Michael Moller. The problem with Freud is that he has a 50-year career during which he's perpetually changing, modifying, going back, contradicting himself. Uh, so we can't pick on any single point and say this is Freudian orthodoxy, this is the gospel truth. The whole point about science is it isn't uh, graved on tablets of stone. <laughs> 
as Freud himself said, it is developed and uh, the truths of one period are surpassed by the next. He granted all this. But we come back to that problem that he does seem to claim to understand. He does seem to be in a position of superior authority. And there's nothing like that sort of claim for bringing out the destructive tendencies in others. The authoritative tone of some of Freud's pronouncements may be only part of the problem. Philosopher of science, Ian Hacking. Freud was deeply concerned with the truth in capital letters, sort of some deep fundamental sort of deep structure truth which underlies everything, but he was indifferent to little bits of the truth. And so that Freud was curiously, paradoxically committed to the truth even though he lied through his teeth all the time. And yet at the same time, he thought he was doing this in the service of some higher truth, which of course we now regard as an exceedingly dangerous way to engage in science. We'll try to repair the damage. You're not to worry. Freud's desire, his self-confessed, almost Napoleonic ambition for greatness, for making a mark in his chosen scientific domain, may, as it is claimed, have led him to shroud certain details about unsatisfactory treatments details which historical detective work have now shown up. This has dented the image of probity which his first biographer, Ernest Jones, raised to seemingly unassailable heights. But not everyone thinks that such selective use of evidence, hardly uncommon if one probes the history of science, subverts the foundations of Freud's achievement. Indeed, knowledge of the workings of his own wishes and duplicities may have made Freud more alert to that interplay between mind and emotions which was the very object of his research. I'm not troubled by the idea that Freud might have been very ambitious and very wishful. Writer and leading psychotherapist, Adam Phillips. I mean, it can't be accidental that for him, as it were, the wish is a, is a powerhouse inside oneself. Because you could see a lot of psychoanalytic theory as extremely wishful. It is the magic of words. So I don't think of Freud as a pernicious or malign liar or deceiver. That, of course, in itself may be wishful, but I don't. I also don't doubt the accounts that we read of the ways in which he fiddles around with the evidence. Because I think Freud is very, very keen on what he finds himself thinking about things. He has a very powerful belief in his own thoughts. Now, a lot of the writers that I most admire also have a very powerful belief in their own thoughts. And I think of Freud more as a writer than a scientist in a traditional sense. And by that I mean he has the courage of his wishes rather than the need to, as it were, abide by reality. Freud's telling us he's a scientist, but he wants to live wishfully. Freud's inventiveness, coupled with the unverifiable nature of what goes on between clinician and patient, is only one part of the case against Freud. There's also the matter that Freud's theoretical speculation allegedly preceded observation and the gathering of clinical data. Data which is by its nature invisible, indeed unconscious, and thus exists only by virtue of interpretation. The claim is that everything is based on observation. Uh, now, if we judge Freud by his own standards, we find, obviously, that his, his claims are without any foundation. Philosopher Michael Bork Jakobsen. You don't observe the unconscious. As Freud himself said, you only apprehend the unconscious uh, once it is translated into the conscious. Uh, now, what Freud called translation is simply uh, the analyst's interpretation. The analyst is going to interpret material produced by the patient in this or that way and say, for example, this dream refers to that, uh, this symptom uh, has to do with uh, this, etc. So it is a complete misrepresentation of the actual state of affairs to say that psychoanalysis is based on the observation. No, it's not based on observation. It's not based on empirical evidence. It's based only on interpretation. And these interpretations are obviously guided and informed by uh, Freud's preconceived theories. So, in fact, the speculations, the speculative superstructure comes before uh, the empirical evidence and, and informs it, and I would say uh, molds it. And we have no way of replicating the observation, uh, we can only trust Freud.